Hello everybody and welcome to Screaming Donkey Woodwork. I'm Dan and today I'm going to show you how I built my puzzle table desk, including all of my screw ups and things that I probably just would do better if I did it again. As you may know, I'm more of a TikTok creator and all these videos came out in short series, so I did my best to stitch them together into one long video. What do you do if you have a year's worth of leftover slab parts laying around your shop? Chop them up and make a desk out of it. But we can't just glue them all together. We have to make the patchwork kind of make sense. So I thought, what makes more sense than puzzle pieces? All right, here's the idea. We're going to cut a bunch of puzzle pieces out of all the slab scraps that aren't quite big enough to make their own table. And then we're going to arrange them and epoxy them all together. But this is my desk and I kind of want to make it in memory of this year. So I'm going to take everything I learned this year and pick a favorite to apply to my desk. So let's take a second to think about all that. So I did a bunch of diorama stuff. I did a bunch of fractal burning. I did a bunch of weird experiment stuff. I even put crochet in the table. I did a bunch with sand and I even learned how to get my cells right when I did water within a table. I did some major color experimenting. I put some bubbles in the table. Oh, and worst of all, I did this dragon skin texturing that was just friggin' terrible. I mean, it turned out gorgeous, but I literally hated every second of it. So I'm not sure all of that's going to make it in, but definitely some of it will. No, oh, I almost totally forgot Shoshugiban. And I could have just said blackening with a torch, but, you know, secret club. Okay, let's describe what I'm doing. I designed the table on easel, and then I just moved pieces of it over at a time based off of the piece of wood that I had. I would flatten each piece of wood on one side, flip it over, and then start carving from it. I'm gonna have to flatten the other end when I finish, so I'll probably actually end up flattening both sides again, but what it did is give me a good flat reference point to start from. I carved down into the wood an inch, and what that will do is allow me some play for when we fill it in with color or black or whatever I end up deciding. I'm pretty sure color or colors, but I'm not all the way there yet. Disclaimer, some things I say may be confusing because I release videos as I make them in the short format. There has been a huge amount of interest in me making more progress and a lot of people disappointed that I'm not done with it yet. This ended up being a perfect piece to sacrifice to the puzzle table because as you can see, there's a bunch of termite damage in it. And right there, I'm cutting through some really bad cupping in the table. As a matter of fact, I didn't take it all the way down because I didn't want to lose too much thickness. And you can see that with the saw marks on the bottom left hand corner. And thankfully, we got enough pieces out of this to go ahead and complete what we need for the puzzle table. So from here, I got to cut out the major pieces with a jigsaw. I'll have to flatten the edges using a templating bit and a router. And then I'll assemble all the pieces on the pour table like a, well, like a puzzle. And I used a half inch bit, so that gap will stay there even when I assemble all of the puzzle pieces. And then we're going to fill it in with some kind of epoxy. A lot of people have hit me up saying to do colors for autism awareness. But then I posted my video and found out there's a whole bunch of controversy around the puzzle piece. Some people really just don't like the group that uses this as a symbol. Now, I was kind of surprised by this because I am the father of two autistic boys. But I definitely wouldn't say I'm always a good parent. And not that dads can't be good parents, but my wife is definitely better at it than me. For example, she believes in teaching by example, and I believe in wearing flip-flops in the wood shop. Please keep your foot prison propaganda to yourself. We're going to continue on by chopping up the slab that I carved out on the CNC last time around. And I have to say this next part. When I was a kid, I very vividly remember my first exposure to a jigsaw. And I thought there's no way you can make a puzzle with that tool. When I saw a scroll saw, that made a whole lot of sense. But yet, here I am in my life making a jigsaw puzzle with a jigsaw. And really here, I'm just roughly cutting out the pieces. I figured I would take them and clean them up a little bit on the bandsaw. This process was probably one of the messiest ones that I've done in a long time. Um, I do have a hose attachment that goes on the back of my jigsaw, but the guard for the jigsaw kept popping off and made it kind of useless. And one of the bolts on the jigsaw came loose and it kept tilting all over the place and finally figured that out. So not super impressed with my Milwaukee jigsaw here. I did try to do some of the cleanup with a flush trim bit and um, I tried with a Diablo and another cheaper one I had. The cheaper one I had seemed to work pretty good. 
but the bearing on that one came off a couple times. I had some spare ones, put those on, but I kind of gave up on it and decided to try it with the bandsaw. What I really need is like a $200 flush trim bit if I want to try to make that work properly. Some of these slabs were like three inches thick and I only had about an inch and a half cutting surface with the compression bit that I was using on my CNC machine. So that shows the necessity for the cutting them apart. I guess I could have bought like a custom $800 bit for the CNC machine, but yeah, no. I love in the comments where someone said, I would have just cut all the way through that with my CNC machine. Oh yeah, me too. Send me the bit and I'll do it. When people comment like that, is it legitimately that they just have no idea what they're talking about? Or is it like they just like are hemorrhaging money and don't even think about buying a bit that's like 800 bucks? I mean, the flush trim bit that I want is like 200 bucks and I can't get myself to buy it. And plus, no joke, I needed some real practice on my jigsaw and my bandsaw. My wife got me this cheap wind bandsaw last year for Christmas, and I've used it like twice. And that's because the blade was kind of garbage. It was too thick for what I was trying to do with it. And I immediately tried to cut up some epoxy, and what I found was that it stuck to the wheel and made the bandsaw not cut properly. But I cleaned it up, got a new blade, and this is what we ended up with. Butamus. With everything cut out, it's now time to jump into the mold making. I screwed it up pretty good, but I think we'll be able to salvage it. Started with a little vacuuming, went ahead and put our UHMW strips on there to seal up the big holes, and then used some silicone to seal up the smaller holes. And the idea is we're gonna pour some tabletop epoxy in it, and it's the good old wise bond, and we're gonna seal the bottom of the table so we can peel it off, cut the edges up, and then do the big pour. So tabletop epoxy is about as thick as peanut butter, so the only way I could ensure that it got all the way down to the edges is to use a syringe and fill in the cracks all the way down to the edges. Because by pouring it, I risk getting it all over the wood, and that would ruin my bond for my later pour. And where did I screw up? Well, I put a little bit too much epoxy in, and it pushed a little bit under the wood. Normally it's so thick it won't, but it did this time. Big mess. Yay. After a week in the mold... That is such a beautiful sound. So what I'm doing here is cleaning up the edges a little bit before we do the main pour. And the reason why is I want it to look like a puzzle piece all the way through, even from the side. Which means I'm going to have to flush down the side and then notch out everywhere between the puzzle pieces. But first I gotta flush it up and my track saw is not quite deep enough to get all the way to the bottom of the table. So I just finish it off with a Japanese pull saw. And it didn't show it here, but right after I hit it with the pull saw, I hit it real quick with the orbital sander. It took about 20 seconds to get the remainder of the ridge from what gets left from the pull saw. Because the kerf from the pull saw is a lot thinner than the kerf on the track saw. Oh, kerf just means the slot that the saw makes when it's cutting through the wood. And we're doing all that so we can do this. So now you can see what I mean. I want the puzzle piece to look like a whole puzzle piece and not just end halfway through the table. So I'm kind of going for the best of both worlds here, the strength of the unified piece of wood and the look of individual puzzle pieces. I guess technically it's not any stronger because you're more likely to break the wood than you are to break the epoxy, but it's definitely less work. So maybe I should have just said I found a better way to be lazier. After this, we will remold it and then we will be able to pour and those little slots will fill up. There's a whole convoluted set of reasonings on why I did it this way, but really it just comes down to it was the best thing I could come up with at the time, and half the fun is the problem solving. So here's one of my first screw-ups. This didn't come out all that bad, but I definitely should have made a jig so that the lines would have been straighter on this. The Dremel multi-tool left some stuff behind, so we're going to hit it with a cheap Stanley chisel. I recommend using your cheap chisels when you know you're going to be doing prying. And we're going to hot glue our polyethylene strips, but right after we forget that we need to sand the inside of these missing puzzle pieces. It's very important to miss and skip steps so you'll have something to do later. Rework always takes twice as much time, so you want plenty of it. If you're paying close attention, you'll notice I made my second screw up. I should have cut back the clear epoxy about a half inch so that the face of it would have the same color as the top of the table. 
The little pieces of UHMW I'm gluing in are just there to block the silicone so I can make a proper seal. And as you can see, there's a ton of these, so we're going to go ahead and warp speed through the rest of them. Don't you wish you could do this through regular parts of boring life? So after we get these all on, the only thing left to do is run a bead of silicone all the way around each one of the pieces and the bottom of the table. Now this is doomed to fail. I'm almost positive I'm going to end up with leaks on this one because I mixed up my epoxy before I started doing this. And I always give this big warning about how you have to let your silicone dry for 24 hours before you pour. So be sure to tune in tomorrow and watch me pour epoxy all over my garage floor. Pouring this puppy tonight. And as always, we start with our two to one deep pour epoxy from Wisebond. I'm not sure how yet, but I know I'm going to be giving away a few gallons of this Wisebond soon. So if you need some deep pour epoxy, stay tuned. So we mix some pearl pigment in, and then we're going to put some trans tint Bordeaux in, which is going to give me a nice deep magenta. I mixed it up using the convenient gallon and a half pour kit from Wisebond. And then I went ahead and made some black up using some black mica. Do you know I agonized over what colors I was going to use on this table quite a bit. And I really ended up settling on the black and magenta because I know my favorite table last year was the black magenta console table. I just love how the magenta stands out against the black and the walnut. And I think it complements it really well. And it's gaudy enough to make me happy. My wife was pretty convinced in her head that I was going to do some kind of gold. I like this better. What do y'all think? Ooh, cinematic mode. And this is some bonus footage. It's a real-time swirl of the epoxy inside one of the puzzle pieces. I get lots of questions on this from other epoxy builders on how I get my swirls the way that I do, and it's really about timing. So I go through starting at about the 12-hour mark and start swirling it every hour. And what that does is it prevents a skin from forming on the top of it. However, if you do let a skin form on top of it, it gives you a whole nother dimension. But you definitely will get bubbles trapped near the surface of the epoxy. And then you have to clean it up by scooping the top out and then pouring clear onto it. But in the end, it does look really cool. So sometimes it's nice to have the skin on there. It's a pain in the butt to do, but sometimes it is pretty cool. And the trick here is just to go slow, take your time with it, and act like you're writing gibberish. If you do too many swirls, and trust me, your hand wants to do a bunch of swirls, it ends up looking like either paisleys or just like weird looking swirls. So many times I see a table that could have been awesome, but they gave up at the swirls. It's also super important to come back after the fact and clean it up either with a heat gun or with a torch to pop the bubbles. Another seven to 10 days later, it's time to enjoy the sounds of deep molding. So the polyethylene really isn't stuck to the epoxy. It's more, I use the hammer to break the bond between the hot glue. And then there's also kind of a suction between the polyethylene and the epoxy because it's like perfectly molded to each other. So if anyone says mold release, you can't use mold release for hot glue. I couldn't pull it off. I couldn't figure out why. That was before I noticed that the epoxy leaked under the table, creating that suction bond between the polyethylene and the plywood. But it's polyethylene, so it doesn't stick. Bigger tables always need a little bit more help.
completely unnecessary. Time for some flattening. All these puzzle pieces were slightly different heights because they came from a bunch of different slabs. So if I wanna do a fast pattern cut on this for flattening, I have to hit all the really high spots first. So that's what I did. And then I put it into a pattern cut and let it do its thing. Knocking down all those high spots first saves me about an hour for flattening. My router is a five foot by five foot and the table that I'm working on is six foot by three foot. So it's a little bit longer than what I can cut. So I left a little bit off the edge so I can flip it around and cut the top off of that later. There is a little bit of art to this technique because especially as you shave thin layers of epoxy off the top or bottom, the wood will twist a little bit. And the way that you wanna fix that is to use a couple of shims when you're doing your match point. And I use tongue depressors for that and I make sure that I still dog the corners down. And it took about a year to figure that out because what ended up happening was I would just keep shaving more and more off the table then I'd end up with this much thinner than I wanted table. The wood has a bunch of tension built up into it and the epoxy shrink as it cures. Combining those two when removing that thin layer makes a little bit of a spring effect. Yet another reason to keep your table as thick as you can for as long as you can. As we're doing the bottom here you can see the larger hunks of wood that make up the whole table. And because we did it right we only ended up having to take about 3 16 off the bottom here. Plus all the wood grain is running in the wrong direction which really prevented it from getting cupping along with all the little splits that we got to make when we made the puzzle pieces themselves. And what we're talking about here isn't huge changes it's really down to like millimeters and half a millimeter. And because I have zero patience we're going to do a little preview with a little bit of alcohol on the table and see how everything is turning out. Yummy yummy. I think I'm actually getting excited about having this in my office. I love that my desk is a card table, but I think this will be better. Yay, let's sand. But first we have to take just a little bit off the edges and get all that leftover silicone off of there. And we did a repour of some of the epoxy to get some divots out. And I used to scrape these off, but I don't do that anymore because as you can see with that 3M sander, it just chews right through it. I spend so much less time sanding now, I'm thinking about going back to my crappy old orbital. I mean, what kind of sanding is this? No shoulder pain, no headache. That's not real sanding. As usual, we're going to burn through this at about 100 times speed. So after I got that report done, I had to fill all the little pits with CA glue, otherwise known as super glue. And there really wasn't much on this table. I think I only spent about 15, maybe 20 minutes doing this. To put that in perspective, the gnome table took me about an hour and a half. And that one's only like a third of this one size, so a lot less on this one. I always do the sides, but rarely do I show it. And on this one, I actually got to show it. This table was super steady on its side, and that's not the case for most of the tables I do. It's quite a bit more sketchy, and I really can't be worrying about the camera falling and the table falling at the same time. So after we get all those pits filled in and sanded up to 150, it's time to go counterclockwise around the table with the little handheld router. A friend of mine just tore her hand up really bad with one of these handheld routers, so be careful with them. And then we immediately jump into sanding with 240, followed up quickly with a nice water pop. I think this is my favorite part of doing the tables now because it's the first time you really get to see what it's going to kind of look like. And I was digging it. I really liked it. I thought, yeah, it's going to turn out great. But in real time, I'm at the point of finishing it, and I could tell you that it turned out so much better than what the water pop revealed. The only thing left to do is to flip it over and do the same thing on the back side. Except for here, you kind of half-ass it because it's the bottom of the table, and I don't really care. The good part about that is after that, the sanding is done, and the only thing left... Finish him! And we're going to start with a screw-up. And the client is a real jerk. So we're not even going to make that much of an effort to clean it up. Yep, I screwed up the brand, so I did it again and then grabbed a sander, but only halfway cleaned it up. In preparation to put on the hard wax, I cut up some non-abrasive white pad and put on my gloves. And we're going with the Rubio Monocoat Plus 2C. And if you didn't catch my joke, this desk is for me. My actual clients are actually very decent people. So what we're going for here is to make the whole table look like it's covered in honey. A lot of people use a squeegee here, and it's a good way to spread out the Rubio really quick. Um, I just really enjoy the visceral action of scrubbing it into the wood. Doing it with the squeegee is probably faster and quite a bit more visually appealing, but I always end up scrubbing it anyway, so I just start with scrubbing, and I kind of like doing it. And you will definitely notice that I didn't take as much care sanding the bottom of the table as I did the top, and that's because 
I don't care. It's my table. I never care about the bottom. But it does need to be protected, so you want to finish the top and bottom on the same day. Because if you don't, you may learn the hard way that your table will warp overnight. It's not like I've ever done that twice. So I put down some drying pyramids, flip the table over, and the drying pyramids just keep it off of the table so the bottom has an opportunity to dry along with the top. But before we apply the Rubio, we always got to clean off with some mineral spirits. The process is the same as the bottom, so I'm not going to rehash all of it, but you get to see the Rubio going on here, and man, did I get excited. So I couldn't resist, but taking some shots, walking down the table, look at that. That's with the Rubio still on it. You can see how shiny it is in some spots and uneven, but man, it's looking pretty good. So I had two major flaws. Here is the first one, the clear coat. I should have chipped that out before I did my second pour, but that's the back of the table, and this little scratch here, which I think is from the air gun, but I'm gonna leave it. A forever reminder to me to not drag the air hose over the tables. Final product, couldn't be happier. Can't wait to replace my card table. Later this weekend, I'll be releasing a kit for I think 750 bucks to the first 10 people. It'll be a kit where you can make a two by two end table and even a puzzle piece end table. I'm only making 10, so if you're interested, find my contact in my bio. With the Rubio dried, it's time to put on some legs. This is the second to last step before I can throw it up in my office and start using it. The first step is always to measure 25 times and then to drill once. You want to make sure that you're equal distance from both sides. I use the Forstner bit to get good, easy centering. Then we just go around the rest of the table and give it a little tap, tap, tap -a I know there's been a big trend to recess the legs into the table, but it's not really necessary. If you want and like the look of it, you can do it for sure, but it looks just fine without it unless like you poke your head under the table and then you would think maybe they could recess that a little bit. Personally, I know my line of sight will never be at a point where I will actually be able to see whether it's recessed or not. One major advantage to the Forstner bits is they don't pull themselves through the wood, you have to push through. So you're never gonna like drill beyond where you're trying to drill to. I use the little black shoulder on there as a visual reference to make sure that I just don't drill too far into the table. So in this case, the epoxy is slightly harder than what the wood is, so I had to put a little bit more effort in it to get it through the epoxy. And as you can see, the epoxy makes quite a bit more mess. A quick countersink on all the holes, and then I'm ready to go ahead and put in the threaded inserts. I use some type on on the threaded inserts, but it's actually probably not necessary, but it does lubricate up the insertion. I like where this is going. Giggity, giggity, giggity. When I got to this last one, I noticed there was a shaving of wood stuck in the hole. So nice slow motion spray out there. A quick little tighten down of all of them and we're ready to rock and roll onto the other side. But this side three of the holes had epoxy that I was drilling into. So I just go ahead and heat those up. No glue, just warm them up for about seven seconds and then insert them into the table. The epoxy can be somewhat brittle. So the last thing you wanna do is try to shove that in there without warming those up first. Then I did a quick little check to make sure all the holes were aligned. If they're not, burn the table, start over. Let's talk a little bit about ceramic coating on a wood table. I'm using Carbon Method, and the idea is you'll put several layers of the ceramic coating on, and it'll protect the wood long-term from UV and from moisture, and I think it makes it hydrophobic from what they say. Now, I'm not really going to do a how-to on how to apply this. If uh, you buy the Carbon Method, they have a great YouTube video that's a tutorial on how to use it. I just want to talk a little bit about what I found out when using it. So I used it after the Rubio Monaco, which is my hard wax, and I only sand at 240 when I do the Rubio. But I'm considering next time taking it all the way to 1000 because in theory the ceramic coating will protect it better. The biggest reason you don't want to sand too high is because there's more surface area for the Rubio to absorb into. So Rubio tells you only go to 240. I don't know, there's definitely some experimenting to do. What I can say is I got about the same sheen I would have got if I would have sanded it to a thousand. It's so not mere glass, but it's almost getting there, if that makes sense. And this reveal is after four coats of the ceramic coating, and I like it right there, and that's where we're going to stop. Hey, thanks so much for watching along with this. It's been a whole lot of fun doing. But for now, I just want to get this up into my office so I have something better than a card table.